Hi, Chris Glynn here with the Nightlight Podcast, once again joined by author Simon Bennett. Simon, I'm always excited when the Lord lays on your heart a topic to share on this program. What do you have for us today? Yeah, well, this class is slightly different, I believe. I'd like to entitle it, The Time of the Harvest is is here. Especially speaking on this topic, uh, because uh, I was away about a month ago with some friends and we had a time of worship. And during that time of worship, someone played a, a recorded prayer that was uh, a Christian prayer for, for unity in the country and for a sort of unity and harmony and togetherness. And I had my little book with me and a pen and I just I just felt the Lord kind of giving something. So I decided to write it down and ended up sharing it. And it's ended up being, I think, helping me to sort of see clearly the times we're living in and the Lord's view on it and what is happening in the kingdom of God at this time, as it were, you know, what we should be focusing on in the kingdom of God. If it's all right, I'd like to ask you to read it. Sure. It's full of scripture, this word, so it's uh, a blessing. Choose you this day who you shall serve. There is a great sifting, a great separating. The wicked are becoming more and more wicked, and the righteous are becoming more and more righteous. There is that great separation at the end of the world, where I will separate the wheat from the chaff, the good wheat from the tares. I separate, but men also separate themselves by their words, their words of blasphemy or their words of testimony. The great separation has begun. The consensus between good and evil can no longer stand. Choose you this day whom you shall serve. If God be God, serve him. If Baal be God, serve him. As soon as the righteous come together, I will pour out my spirit upon them. When men are truly holy, separating themselves from the evil, the lies, and the compromises of the world, they will be made fit for my purposes. There is no unity between good and evil. There is no fellowship between light and darkness. Wow, so Simon, this was a prophecy that someone received, right? Yeah, a prophetic word um, in response to this prayer that was a kind of a call for unity. Right. As we can see, it's very reminiscent of the story of Elijah when Elijah went up on Mount Carmel and he told the people, how long are you going to waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. Yes. It speaks of this harvest at the end of the world, which Jesus talks about in the Gospels in Matthew 13, in the parable of the wheat and the tares, where he's going to separate the wheat and the the wheat goes into the barn and the, the tares are burnt. And it speaks of that harvest. It's speaking that this is the day of decision. This is the time of decision. Yes. There's a, a special verse in the book of Joel, which has especially been speaking to me at this time, uh, Joel 3, 14 and 15. And it reads, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. In the word, the Lord was saying it is time to choose It is time to make decisions. So in the scripture, it's the same thing. This is the time of decision for multitudes and multitudes on the face of the earth. Because every single person is going to be brought to a point of decision in the days ahead because of the coming tribulation. That's right. The coming mark of the beast. And it seems like this is going to be for everybody, for Christians who are perhaps entangled with the world. It's going to be a time of decision of whether to to, to separate themselves completely unto Christ. I'm sure there's plenty of unsaved folks who realize that something is very wrong in the world today and who are searching for why is this happening and what is happening? What does the future hold? I'm sure. And there's also those who are, are leaning the other way and who are blinded by the propaganda and the media. And they need warning that all is not as it seems, that there is great deceit happening in the world. And so it's sort of come to me that this is a time of harvest because everybody is at this point of decision. And therefore, there's a great work for the people of God 
to bring the word of God to people so that they are better able to make a decision on their lives and on the decisions they're going to make in the future. Yes. And so it's sort of come to me sort of quite strongly that it's a time of harvest. It's a time for God's people to be very active in delivering the word of God to people. I mean, we, we saw it in the UK during the lockdowns that this separation is happening with the vaccination sort of mandates that sort of families were, were separating, literally. Parents who were um, receiving the vaccines would be very upset with their children who said, no, there's something wrong with it, or vice versa. But we just saw this happening through the lockdowns, this kind of separation and division beginning, right. the beginning of that harvest of the end. So I've been thinking about that from that word that this is a point of decision. The Lord is saying to the population, choose, choose me, but you have to make a choice that this is a, a harvest time. And I just wanted to share some, you know, having sort of felt that, uh, just share uh, what I've discovered in the word, what the Lord has been showing me in the word about harvest time and what it means to us as Christians and how we can best take advantage of this harvest time. Shining bright through the dark night, you're listening to Nightlight. One of the first things about harvest time is if you're living on a farm and it's harvest time. Like you do in South Africa, right? Oh, well, we do, but we do have very little harvest right now. But, it's just, uh, um, but yes, if it's harvest time, then it's a time when everybody pitches in. You might be a stable boy, you might be a milkmaid, you might be a shepherd. But that, that week of harvest, you know, in England, it would come maybe in August, I think. It's all hands on deck because this is the most important time. The, the viability of the farm depends on bringing in the harvest. Right. And just so I think as a church, as the body of Christ, this is the harvest time. You know, this is a time when, you know, we're obviously all in our little places, but somehow I feel the call is coming from the harvest fields. It is time to harvest. And I think it's a another situation where, it would be wonderful if it was an all hands on deck situation, you know, and if all Christians could participate in the harvest and focus on it. Yes, that would be great. But if I had seen this message, the title, The Time of the Harvest is Near, you know, I might have had a negative reaction. I might have felt, oh, but I've got enough on my plate. Please don't ask me to do anything else. Right. I'm already, you know, tired and burdened and I, I don't really want to be asked to do anything else. But I really just love this passage from John 4, where it, it talks about Jesus participating in the harvest. And it, uh, I just found it really encouraging. Uh -huh. So if you remember in John 4, Jesus is, uh, he's very, very tired and exhausted. And he's gone to sit down by the well while his disciples go in to get food. He ends up having this just wonderful encounter with this this woman and her sort of prophetic encounter and a prophetic appointment and he speaks into her life. Wow. And she ends up going, you know, going back into town almost at the same time that the disciples return to Jesus. And um, I guess I'd like to ask you to read that Paris from John four, thirty two to thirty six. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked her, what do you want, or why are you talking with her? Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And uh, just really struck me that, you know, Jesus was tired and exhausted. But for him, the revival, the, the strengthening came from participating in God's work. That's right. And so therefore, I do believe that this applies to us too, that our food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. 
this is what's going to strengthen us in this time is if we are actively participating in the harvest actually i think it's just key to focus on god's work at this time yes and um, a key strengthening to us it's a sort of reminiscent also of the spies going into the the promised land and all the spies were saying well, we can't go in there because there's giants but caleb said in numbers 14 9 only do not rebel against the lord nor fear the people of the land for they are our bread so he was saying that the work that god had for them though challenging, was going to be their strength. It was going to be food for them. It would make them stronger. That's right. And I just feel from that passage that we do need to participate in this harvest. Amen. Because it's going to be our strength. It's going to be difficult times ahead. And we need the strength of God. And I think it comes from participating in the work of God. And so if you're feeling tired, worn out, exhausted, then I believe just turn your face towards the work of God. Turn your face towards the harvest fields and see how you can participate. And I believe it will be strengthening and a blessing and we will revive you. Feeling tired? Get inspired with Nightlight. I just wanted to talk a little bit more just about the the harvest and the seed and, and, and sowing and harvesting. In the Bible, it, Jesus talks in the parable of the sower about uh, the harvest, right? And, and the sower who's sowing, you know, on the different grounds. And he sows the seed on the good ground. And it brings forth this, this wonderful harvest, uh, sometimes a hundred times. Wow. And he says quite clearly that the seed is the word of God. So the word of God is, okay. is the thing that brings transformation. It, it's the thing that brings life to people, revives people, transforms people. That's right. And it is the thing that is going to help people to make the right choices in the future. Yes. And it's just beautiful passage of many people's favorite passage about the word of God and about how when it goes out or when it's sown, it never returns back empty. And this is this beautiful passage in Isaiah 55, 11 and 12, which I'll probably ask you to read again, Chris. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out with joy and be led out with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth into singing before you. And all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. So this is just such a beautiful passage about those who participate in the harvest, um, taking the word of God out to the people. And the whole of creation rejoices when the word of God goes out. Wow. And it says that we'll go out with joy and be led forth with peace. So there's promises again for this, uh, this harvest. I guess... It perhaps does depend slightly on on where you are in the world, the receptivity of the ground. Right. And uh, I'm sure there are some places where the ground is quite hard, but the Lord still just loves his word to go out wherever, even if it is to people who may not receive it. You are giving them the opportunity. And that is our, our job is to give them that chance. Yes. As disciples of Christ, we would like a good harvest. I, I love the verse. I think it's John 15, 8, where it says, Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. Just linking that, disciples are ones who bear much fruit. And to bear much fruit, we need to sow, we need to sow seed. 2 Corinthians 6, 9 says, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. If we want to harvest, if we want to participate in the harvest, we're going to need a lot of seed. And we're going to need to sow a lot of seed. And I think God wants his seed sown. He just wants it out there. Um, I remember doing an immigration center ministry in the UK. And we used to have over 100 people from all over the world in the immigration center come to the meetings. And they were a wonderful blessing. But at the end, we were like, oh, we wonder which ones of these folks are the ones that, how are we going to find out which ones we should really, you know, focus in on? And I remember the Lord saying to my heart quite clearly, um, sow the whole field. Wow. Just sow the whole field. And so we decided to, to offer 
uh, weekly Bible studies in the mail to everybody who wanted them. Super. And out of that, then we had people writing and saying, well, I'm going back to Pakistan. I'd like to do the same ministry you're doing in Pakistan. And we had sort of great fruit from that. And so I think sometimes God says, sow the whole field. <laughs> Just sow the field. Just sow as much seed as you can. And then you will have a good harvest. Praise God. So there's all different ways of sowing seed, obviously. There is online, and you have a, a, an amazing online ministry, Chris. And it's reaching all over the world, which you couldn't possibly do any other way. But there's also just this sort of local ministry in our own area. And sometimes I do believe in the power of the, the written word, the power of the tract in sowing God's word. Yes. And, and giving people the opportunity to come to a decision. Chris, would you like to read a little passage about tracts that I've, I've put there? When we scatter literature, we liberate thistle down. Light fluffy down which is attached to thistle seeds, enabling them to be blown about in the wind, which, blown by the winds of the spirit, floats over the world. The printed page never flinches, never shows cowardice, never compromises. It travels cheaply and needs no haul. It works while we sleep, it never loses its temper, and it will still work long after we are dead. The printed page is the visitor which gets inside the home and stays there. It always catches a man in the right mood because it only speaks to him when he is reading. It always sticks to what it has said and never answers back. And it is bait left permanently in the pool. When we give a person a tract, especially in maybe the poorer areas, the people will take them home, you know, and they'll share them with their family. Yes. And they'll share them with their friends. You know, it, it just has a life of its own then. So, so much more potential than just talking to someone. If you have something to give them, then there's so much potential for that to bring light and life. Right. So I've started developing my own tracts and I have my own tracts, but it's really something I'd kind of like to throw out there to all the listeners. You know, do you have, do you have literature would you like literature? Do you have tracts already that you're giving out? Perhaps you'd like to, to share them. And if we have a pool of tracts, then people are able to choose, you know, which, which seed they, they feel uh, more comfortable and happy and, and confident in sharing. But I do think it's, it's time to sow the seed. It's sort of time to participate in God's harvest right now. Simon, let me just put in a plug here for Anthony and the Helping Hand Ministry in Cape Town, who I interviewed on the show recently. They use tracks a lot in their outreach and personal witnessing. And Anthony, who's a Christian comics artist, has produced a large variety of tracks which are freely available from his website. And listeners, I will include the link to where you can see and even download those tracks below. Yes, no, so it's very much finding the right seed for the ground, uh, deciding if you need it in a local language for those of us who live in, in foreign countries and, and sort of making those decisions and, and then getting the seed right for the, the field that you're, you want to sow in. And uh, some may need a, a, a softer message, some may need a, a, a stronger message. Yes. I just remember in England, uh, it was during the lockdown and I was working in a, a Subway sandwich store in the UK. And I remember being where I was, I was right by the, at the toaster and suddenly this, this verse, the Joel verse came to me and I wasn't that familiar with it. It sort of faintly in my head, I knew it, but it was that verse, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Yes. And because the Lord spoke it into my life, I just knew this is true. I need to go out and do more. And I would, I would get up early before I took my kids to school. You know, I'd, I'd just go around, I'd just put letter tracts in all the letter boxes in my area. Wow, God bless you. Obviously, with evangelism and with this thing, it's, it's really good to go two by two, basically. It's, there's so much strength in doing this work together with somebody else. So this is also what we need to ask God to do is join us with people who have the same vision so that we can be effective. It's uh, challenging to go out by yourself harvesting, and I don't think it's always, that's always God's best plan. But because I didn't really have anyone else in the area, that was what I was doing. And this is probably, again, the key for the harvest that Jesus uh, stated in Matthew 9, 37. The harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. 
Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into the harvest. So as we see this, this harvest time and the importance of it, Jesus instructs us to pray for laborers. Amen. To pray that we will become laborers and then to pray that we can be joined with other people who've also caught the same vision and together we can have a great harvest if we're uh, laboring together. And so I think that's another very important point. If you want a good harvest, the best way to get a great harvest is to inspire other people that it's the harvest time and that they too can participate, can participate in it. Yes. And a lot of us do feel incapable. We are incapable. We're incapable of doing God's work. It's a, it's a work of his spirit. It's a work that he does through us. His power is made perfect in our weakness. That's right. Another encouraging verse, I think, is is Psalm 125, 5 and 6, where it reads, Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves before them. You never fail if you go out to sow God's word. Amen. Very often you will be rejoicing when you return. Yes. And if you see no result, you have been faithful to deliver God's word to the people, which is what he desires right now. All these people at the point of decision, we find that possibly the institutional church hasn't prepared people for the last days. They haven't received really the last day's word that they may need to help them to be aware. So it's just a a huge job now, I think, for those of us who see the harvest to go out and sow sow the word of God there. And I think, Chris, maybe we can close with uh, that last passage, uh, which is the end of the passage of John 4, which we read uh, about Jesus and the woman at the well. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. So where is our joy going to (laughs) come at this last day's dark times? It seems that the joy will come in participating in God's harvest. That's where the joy and the strength is going to lie. Amen. I just want to encourage all the listeners here just to be quiet and, and then just to find a way with God's help to participate in getting his word, especially, you know, the truths of Matthew 24, which is the great summary, the great cornerstone of last day's scripture, out to his people and out to all the people in the world. Encouraging you how very dearly Jesus loves you. You're listening to Nightlight. Very happy if anybody wants to be in touch, if anybody's looking for tracts, we also can go to as uh, the Helping Hands folks in Cape Town. But um, we do need seed. Without seed, you cannot have a harvest. Um, and I think we do need seed. So that's an important start, maybe, is to, is to locate some good seed and then be ready to, to sow it in whatever way you're able to. And you also, Simon, have some tracks available, right? Yeah, I do have tracks. Yes, I do. I have three kind of almost on the back of this message. Yeah, there's this fact that the people are being brought to a point of decision. So I do have three tracks. Um, so if anybody wants to get in touch and, you know, they're quite cheap to print a little uh, A6 booklet or little little pages and you can print them quite cheaply and, and then participate in this this harvest. Do get in touch. It's at Let's Look Forwards at gmail.com if you would be interested in uh, receiving some template for the tract and then you you know adapting it so you can put your details in at the bottom obviously and then you're able to distribute something in your area and thank you so much simon that's all for now this is chris glynn signing out and looking forward to the next time bye-bye